What up, y'all? It's Dev. SVMTG, we like it. A magic I can fit into more of my old shirts every day. And today, we're going to do my favorite video to do every season. It's the top 10 sleepers in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Now, at this point, we've been doing these top 10 sleeper videos on YouTube for seven years every time a new set comes out. So do I really have to continue explaining what a sleeper is? I'm going to, just briefly. It's a card not enough people are talking about. Maybe no one's talking about it. Maybe the card is getting a little bit of attention, but people aren't taking it seriously enough. Maybe it's a card that has to wait on rotation or another set to drop to see true relevance. So there's a lot of things that a sleeper can be. But for the most part, these videos are just me talking about 10 plus cards with the honorable mentions that probably won't see too many people talk about them ever again. So at the very least, I like that these videos serve to get some cards some attention and they'll never be talked about again, but at least they get their 15 minutes. <laughs> that said, I think we have a success rate of about one and a half cards <laughs> per video. So what will those 1.5 cards be this time? Let's find out. But you know, let's kick things off first by looking at some honorable mentions <laughs> so you know where you are. Uh, honorable mentions plural because I couldn't just pick one this time. I, I went to write out my sleepers list and by the time I was done, I had 28 entries on that sleepers list, so I really had to shed some tears paring it down to just 10 entries, but I did allow myself five honorable mentions this time around with the sleepers list, but I'm going to try to run through these like super fast, 100% completion speed run. Actually, it's going to be kind of 80% still. Honorable mention number one is Runaway Trash Bot. I was trying to figure out if I wanted this to be the two-drop artifact that lets you play things you discard, but that was probably seeing a little bit too much hype. And then I thought, oh, maybe this could be Patchwork Automaton, but that's probably seeing a little bit too much hype. This card, basically no one's talking about at all. Like, actually thinking the right kind of combo deck under the exact right circumstances, the card could work. If you're able to just flip your library over into your graveyard and somehow, like, reanimate this guy with haste, or, like, something like that, right? Like, reanimate multiple copies of this guy with haste. Like, it's got built-in trample. So if you have enough stuff in your yard, like, this could swing. This could swing for lethal in one shot. This could OTK somebody. I could see it happening. All I'm saying is, look out. It's Think about it. Could be a decent combo piece. Probably not going to happen, but it has the makings of a good combo piece if it gets the right cards. But it probably won't. Sunblade Sam is up next. This card is uh, just cool. I like this card. It can be a 4-4 Vig. Or it can just be a, a Plains, which I, I guess I like both of those. And if it's a Plains, it also gets you two life. It's literally an Environmental Sciences, only you get to cast it at instant speed. And your White Tech. And I think there's something to it. Could be a good card. Just pay attention to it. Behold the Unspeakable is next. Uh, I haven't got to talk much about this card this previous season. I will say, though, the only bad thing about the card is its casting cost. Five is probably too much for this. But if you look at all the stuff it does, it's like really good stuff. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. I know it's... I know it's unspeakable, I shouldn't be talking about it, but here I am. It's the first mode is good. It's a Bayine Veil, minus two, minus two, zero to everything. You won't die. <laughs> you, you spend five men on your turn, and you, you get to not die. So that's something. And then on the next turn, you draw a billion cards, and the next turn, you get a huge flample guy. Like, I don't know. Could be a better card than it looks like. And note, too, that when you draw all those cards, and when you get the huge flample guy, you got all your mana untapped. Protect your huge flample guy. Draw all those cards. You got all your mana on tap. That's good. I don't know. It it's, could be better than it looks. I like sort of the way it lines up. I, these aren't. I'm not going through these as fast as I thought I was going to. Aside from that, high speed hoverbot. I want to look at you. Uh, you might go in the mono blue tempo deck. That's a thing. It deck looks like a thing. It could be, and you could go in there. But finally, and probably the best of these honorable mentions, like the actual good. Well, Sunblade Samurai might be okay for real, but. Kami's Flare is the last of the honorable mentions. I just couldn't find a place to put this on the list. I didn't feel like a removal spell really needed to be on the list. Watch there be a removal spell on the list. There is not. That's good. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, this card's awesome, right? Have you even seen it? <laughs> I was amazed by how many people on stream the other night hadn't even seen this card. We're not aware of this card's existence. If you're able to blow up their guy and hit him for two, like in your burn deck, your mono red aggro deck, like actually a really really good card so just be on the lookout in case you didn't weren't even aware this card existed it does and it's pretty good let's do the actual list as soon as you like and subscribe do these things go to twitch check out patreon if you want to vote on content blah 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 self-promotion done i hate it as much as you do so let's move on to the actual list here very uncomfortable with self-promotion but number 10 is generous visitor and you might think that i'm being too generous to this card, putting on the sleepers list. I know that some people have talked about this, 
But this is one of those that falls into the category of like, I don't think people are taking it seriously enough. A lot of people refer to this card as just like cute. It's probably it's probably too cute, right? And I don't know, man. You could have a 3-3 swinging by turn two and on the play, it's actually pretty serious. And it's cool to have like an enchantress, like a thing that procs off of enchantments that you play on turn one. You just don't see that too often. On exactly the right start, this card can swing for a six on turn three, which is... Again, maybe pay attention to that. I'm pretty sure you don't have any more cards in your hand if you're, if you're able to pull that start off. That kind of sucks. But again, under the right conditions, this thing can swing for a lot of mana really quickly. And especially the farther you go back in terms of formats, the more options they have for decent 1 and 2 mana enchantments and auras. So this might be even more of a player in farther back formats. So we might be looking at a really powerful card here that people are taking notice of. And then just kind of walking past, like, oh, that's kind of neat. What's the next card? And I really think that we should focus a little bit more on how good this card might potentially be. Number nine is Jugon Defends the Temple. And I've, I've been a little rough on this card in the past, but I will defend it. Thank you for defending the Temple. I'll defend you, Jugon. I think this card might have some potential. Three mana is a startup cost. It's a little bit more than I want to play, but it does affect the board the turn you play. It gives you a 1-1 dude that you can like block with, <laughs> like not get run over. Later turns, it can ramp. At the very least, it's a 3-mana 1-1 dork. You know, it's, it's not a card that's playable, but that's only one of the things it does. You know, The next turn, it can make your dork a little bit bigger along with something else. It just puts counters on two guys, but once it does flip over, it gets you a 2-2. Now, in addition to the 1-1 dork that it already got you, I would say you're paying 3-mana for three power, split among two bodies, one of those bodies ramps, it's already kind of a decent deal. And as a matter of fact, you're getting more power than that because you're putting plus one, plus one counters on things on chapter two. So one, two, three, four, five power for three mana. Could be worse, right? But then you get even more power as the game goes on. And you can, you know, when you, when you flip this over into a creature, you'll have all your mana open. So you can play a creature and immediately, like, bigify that creature by whatever mana you got left over. So it can actually start doing cool stuff the turn that it flips over. That's nice. And then once it gets big enough, or once you have enough modified dudes, I guess, suddenly this thing is seven power and has abilities. So it's just for your three mana investment, I mean, you had to invest a lot more mana and cards time turns into it before it's all said and done but your initial investment of three mana can get you what seven eight nine ten power before it's before it's all d done with so i don't know like if if you, and the card really doesn't require too much support just like play one or two other play some other guys <laughs> play some other dudes and like you don't even have to play modified dudes because the card modifies your dudes for you so like I don't know, like, the card might be a little bit better than I originally judged it, because the initial investment of three mana seems a little bit high, but you sure do get a lot by the time the card's done doing things, and it sure does do a lot of those things. It's not, it might not be a bad magic card. Now, for number eight, you might say that I'm not in touch with reality, but I'm going to put Temeshi, Reality Architect, here in the, in the Ocho slot. This card actually is intriguing to me. For a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, if you just have like a fading hope and you play this with four mana, it's not bad because you play this, you got your one mana left, you're fading hope something, you, you draw a card. That's not, that's not terrible. It also kind of works pretty well with the blue legendary land that allows you to bounce stuff, right? Because this is a legend. It reduces the cost of that card by at least the one mana, right? So if you have this on the table, it's only going to cost three to play the blue legendary land's channel ability. And then you get to draw something too, like... Being able to bounce something back to the opponent's hand and also draw a card actually just kind of in and of itself seems good. Maybe not good enough, but just good. But there's actually a lot more on this card. I've only talked about the first line of text. It's the one I'm most excited about. But I will say, too, it has a second ability that's really potentially ridiculous. Right? Like the second ability reanimates artifacts and enchantments and just draws a card, because why not? Um, <laughs> right, you return a land, you control it to your hand, but you get to draw a card because you did that. But reanimating just whatever artifact or enchantment you want, given that you have the mana, is uh, potentially really sick. And you can do it, like, every turn. <laughs> you can do it multiple times in a turn. The card doesn't tap to use its ability. If you have enough mana, you can use the ability the same turn you play the card. So, like, you rip it on turn eight. <laughs> you can play it for your three mana, and then whatever mana you have left, you can sink into it to use its ability that same turn. 
reanimating artifacts and enchantments is actually like pretty tempting. <laughs> it's, a, it's not bad at all, especially when you have artifacts and enchantments that you can pop for some effect and then bring them back. Like this card actually does a lot for not a ton of mana, and it doesn't have that thing where like, oh, you have to wait a turn to get value. Like there's multiple ways in which you could use this card the same turn that you play it and get value, given that you have the amount of mana that you need. So, I don't know, man. This is actually kind of a cool card on a couple of different axes, and I like it. Maybe more than I should, but I really like it. Number seven is Raichu. Uh, Thundering Raichu, it, even though the card is not as good as I thought it was when I first read it, it's still on my sleepers list, right? I think they chickened out a little bit here by not counting Thundering Raichu itself <laughs> for its ability that's a little lame but still i think this can be a four mana four four haste or a four mana three three haste puts counter on something a four mana four four haste that shocks an opponent if you have a couple of other modified dudes out like there's a lot that this can potentially actually do for you you can sometimes just ambush your opponent by playing this on turn four putting a plus one plus one counter on your three drop getting in with both of them hitting them for one in the face with raiju's ability there's just a lot that this does and i think i like it more than a lot of the four drop options that mono red has i think the closest thing they have to this is like creepy puppeteer and i'm not really sure which one i like better you know you have to support both cards like creepy puppeteer is best supported by one drops so like Fireblade charger right you make your charger into a four three if it dies during combat it borrows charms an opponent like this it all seems pretty good and puppeteer has haste and four power naturally this you have to enable by making sure you have other modified dudes or whatever so you have to enable them in different ways but ultimately i'm not sure which creature i like more i will say though that there's a mono red aggro deck like coming up you know we got we already had a mono red one drop with two power we got another one in this set we got another decent looking red one drop in the form of a saga there's a couple of interesting reasons to want to look towards mono red in the format right now and i think that deck's going to need a good four drop whether it's creepy puppeteer or this or something entirely different i'm not sure but i do think this is at least on the menu for that deck number six is tatsunori toad rider i feel like i'm the only dude talking about this card i talk about him all the time but I feel like I'm the only one actually talking about this card. Um, Toad Rider. Most people lick Toads to get their jollies. This dude rides Toads. He must be tripping nuts, like, all the time. With all that contact, like, ball-to-back ball contact on a, on a giant fluorescent Toad. It's, it's probably a whole lot of fun, but, like, one way or the other, I think the card is really powerful. Seriously, there's all kinds of lines that I envision with this card that just, like, make me salivate. Like, on turn three, you play this guy. Right, we'll start there. And then on turn four, you can play, say, a do-nothing enchantment and make up for that enchantment that does nothing, like a hallowed haunting or something. Make up for that enchantment that does nothing by making a 3-3. Three, three. Not bad, right? But you can also play an enchantment creature on turn four, at which point you've just put who knows how many stats onto the table all in one go. Or you could play... Like an Oblivion Ring, you know, something that removes something from their side of the table. And then in this case also gives you a 3-3. Like, all of that is ridiculous value. You can Meat Hook Massacre for like X equals 2 on turn 4 after you play this card. Tatsunori doesn't die. The Toad that it, die, that it makes doesn't die, right? So, end of the day, eventually you'll be sitting there with a couple of 3-3s. Three you just blew all your opponent's early stuff away. So, there's a lot of like... Very dumb <laughs> plays that follow this card up. And it's not even dumb. Like, it just gets through unblockable. Not unblockable. It flies. <laughs> it can be blocked by flying reach guys or whatever. But still, sometimes this is going to, for three mana, just kind of make six power that's hard to block. And, like, that's kind of stupid. For, like, for just three mana? That's not a whole lot of manas for what you get from this card. And it's, like, super easy to enable. How hard is it going to be? To find a turn four enchantment. Just play a Binding the Old Gods. Kill that guy, get a 3-3. Three, three. Like, you're feeling pretty good about that play pattern. So, I don't know. I think this guy could actually do a lot in the current standard. If this video accomplishes nothing else, at least it will have coined the term ball-to-back contact. So, I guess I can be proud of that. But, let's move on to number five, which is Restoration of Iganjo. There's going to be multiple of these sagas on this list because there's so many of them in this set and some of them people are just freaking out about it. they're gonna be so good some of them people are rightfully saying are just like trash cards that go in the 
trash. That's where they go. Um, and then in some, I think people either aren't giving enough of a chance or people just like don't know how good they really are. You know, like earlier, I, I tasked myself <laughs> with defending Jugan, even though I'm not sure how good that card actually is. This card, I, I think that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be much easier for me to defend because I actually believe this is a nuts card. And nobody knows what they're talking about. It's actually very good. I paid three mana. I get a three, four that makes more power and toughness as the turns go on and has vigilance. So it can make more than one, one, one over a turn cycle, right? Puts the planes in your hand. That fourth mana will always be decent. Reanimating a thing will always be good, especially if you're able to stock your graveyard with stuff the first couple of turns of the game. I just, there's too much that I like about this. It's all utility, but it's just the right kind of utility. And the creature that you get eventually is, I think, worth the wait. But how are we going to restore my reputation after pimping that card for a while there? Let's look at, um, this won't do it. Let's look at number four, Surge Hacker Mech. Um, I've made this point about this card a couple times this previous season, but I just want to make this point as often as possible so as many people see it as possible. So that enough, like, as many people know that this is a thing as possible. Again, I just think this is cool as Seeker's Chariot tech. And even if your opponent's not playing a Seeker's Chariot, it's still just a fine card. It's still like a 5-5 five, five evasive beater that's like as easy to crew as a chariot is, right? But when your opponent plays their chariot on turn four, let's say you're on the draw. That's usually not where you want to be in standard magic. But, you know, your opponent is either on the draw or they ramp into an Asika's chariot or something. Well, you just go. You just you just calmly untap your mana. You drop, you drop your land. You play your Surge Hacker Mech. Now, what that does is it shocks one of the cats that they're a Seeker's Chariot made, so now they can't crew their chariot. But if they can crew their chariot and try to swing in on you, you have a 5-5 five, five that completely invalidates their Seeker's Chariot um, on blocks. But you can also just swing in. You, sw you can swing in with your 5-5 five, five if you want to. And it has menace, so they have to double block it. They probably lose a couple of guys. I just think that this is actually probably okay. I think this is probably okay, and like, again, even if your opponent doesn't have an Asika's Chariot, this always comes down and shocks something, and that's probably good most of the time. If you have even like one other artifact, or vehicle for that matter, then suddenly this just does four to something and like always kills something. It kills a Goldspan Dragon without them getting any treasure, like that's noteworthy in this format. So again, so long as you have one other thing on the table uh, that its ability counts, so... I don't know, man. There's kind of a lot about this that I like too much. Like, it kills an old growth troll or something. <laughs> if you have one other thing out. Like, I don't know, man. The card is kind of neat looking to me. I think that for just, you know, for four mana, there's probably better things you could be playing at that rate in this environment. But the way it lines up is really interesting, right? Again, it go it like, attacks through a goldspan dragon. It blocks and kills in a Seeker's Chariot. It kills one of the cats from the Chariot. Like, it's just, again, very, very interesting ways that this thing lines up that I wouldn't be surprised to see if it actually, like, does something in this environment. My number three is another saga, so I was gonna get used to that because my number two is a saga as well. But three is Michika's Reign of Truth. Man, this card looks so good to me, and, like, no one's talking about it. No, no, absolutely no one's talking about this card. I don't get it. It's all that glitters. Every mode is all that glitters, which is my favorite aura of... All time, I really, I really think we're at the point where all the glitters is my favorite one ever. So um, and this is just all the glitters on its first two modes, and on the on the it becomes a creature for two mana for two mana guys. It becomes a creature that is just always has an all the glitters attached to it. It's just it's just stapled to the dude. And this could actually, you could make the point this is better than all the glitters in a lot of occasions. Because when you try to attach all the glitters to one of your dudes, your opponent just plays a removal spell, you get blown out, and that meme of all the dudes going like, oh, that plays, you know, you just feel really bad. Um, but this, you play it, and you try to target a dude with the ability on the first chapter, and like, even if that dude gets blown out, even if that dude gets removed, you still get another shot at it on your next turn. Something all the glitters doesn't do. Something all the glitters also doesn't do is just become a creature. <laughs> you know, a couple of turns later, which is a, a big freaking deal in a lot of ways. So, I don't know, man. Like, you get a couple of turns to build towards the portrait of Michiko actually being, like, a decently sized card. Um, you have all your mana untapped. The turn, the portrait of Michiko, half of it comes into play. So, you can play more artifacts and enchantments and stuff. I just... 
I don't know, man. Like, I just think the card is really, really good. <laughs> I really do. And I mean, unironically, standard playable good. Um, just imagine this card with the turn one hot shot mechanic. So you play your, your Fox McCloud on turn one. Then turn two, you play this thing, and Fox gets to swing for four. And then the next turn, he gets to swing for four again. Turn after that, you get Portrait of Michiko. So depending on what you dropped on turn three, with all that mana that you had open, you could have like a four or five power Portrait of Michiko. It's entirely possible. So I don't know, man. Like the card does not look bad to me. And I'm biased here again. All the glitters is just like, I'm a sucker for Enchantress decks. It's one of the first decks I ever built in like 1995 was an Enchantress deck. So like, I'm a sucker for garbage like this. But in this case, I don't think it's garbage. I think there's plenty of cool play lines you can have in standard with this card that make it more than playable. All right, so number two is another saga. I've already given that away, but it's the, la it's the last saga of the video. So there's that. Number two is Life of Tashira Yamazawa. And look, I know people are talking about this card, but this is another one. That I don't think people are taken seriously enough. A lot of people see this card and they're like, it's a Yumazawa's Jate reference. That's cool, but like they don't I don't think enough people are talking about the actual sheer power level of this card. This might be like one of the better cards in the entire set. I don't think enough people are really seeing that. For one, the actual saga part of it, the first two chapters, are the same thing, but if all they do is gain four life for you, I actually think that Mono Black kind of wants that a little bit, you know. Against some decks, just gaining four life is going to be good enough, but against other decks, you can kill guys, you can kill whole creatures, like you can kill a bunch of one-drops in Mono White right now, from Hotshot Mechanic to, you know, uh, Usher of the Fallen. If they, for some reason, don't put a counter on their Luminarch Aspirant, and they put a counter on their one-drop and swing with it, you can kill the Luminarch Aspirant by dropping this on the next turn. There's a lot of interesting play patterns <laughs> with this card that actually do allow you to destroy creatures with it. And that's when the card is really good, when it allows you to remove a creature, or even two possibly, and get one of your own, only for a two-mana investment. If you can actually, like, three for one somehow with this card, I think you're doing a really good job, but it's not going to happen every time. These mono-black control decks that are actually pretty important in the format right now, again, they kind of want to just gain the life. They don't mind gaining the life and then getting a creature they can block with that also ramps into a blood on the snow. That's... Cool, like one turn, exactly. If you play it on curve, it ramps into a blood on the snow exactly one turn ahead of time. Yeah, I think this probably does belong on the sleepers list because even though it's getting some talk, it's not getting talk for the right reasons. It's actually a standard playable magic card, I truly believe. But we get to number one finally here, and this is another card that some people are talking about, but I don't think people are talking about enough. It's one of the cheapest mythics in the entire set, which should really tell you something and when people do tend to discuss this card in its competitive viability they tend to write it off but i think those people are wrong to write off spirit sister's call now normally when my sister calls me i just don't pick up the phone but in this case this is actually quite the alluring call now, one thing about this is that it can reanimate just about anything, so long as you have a thing to sacrifice that's the same type. Now, that means that it can sacrifice itself. The word another is not on this card anywhere, if you didn't notice. It can sacrifice itself to bring back an omniscience <laughs> in Commander or something like that. Uh, or even in other formats. Just sacrifice itself to bring back a huge enchantment. Now, keep your eyes peeled for, you know, 8, 9, 10 mana enchantments in upcoming sets, because this can always basically trade with them on reanimation. I've compared this card to a Godfarer's Gift before, and again, I think that's a pretty apt comparison. I'm not going to shrink back <laughs> from that comparison. The best way to use this card is to find a way to get compounded value over multiple turns with it. Get three of its triggers, and then suddenly it will take over the game, you'll very likely win that thing. It really just seems like a five mana enchantment that provides a ridiculous amount of inevitability over the course of a couple of turns. And I don't think, again, that people are taking seriously enough the amount of inevitability this thing could provide for you, especially in a format that no longer has Auron's Epiphany as an option, no longer has Divide by Zero as an option. These sort of five mana enchantments look much, much more playable. I've already kind of joked that I'm looking sideways at Skeletal Swarming, like that might be a halfway decent card again, <laughs> in this sort of more mid-range oriented format that we may find ourselves in very soon. And I'm not joking when it comes to five mana enchantments like Swarming, for one. And like this, I think that enchantment 
that allows you to get like this kind of really hot, inevitable value over the course of a couple of turns might be actually playable in standard for the first time in a while. And in terms of all the enchantments we have access to, all the effects in general that we have access to that provide you turn-by-turn -turn value that's hard for your opponent to get over, this might be one of the best cards in standard for generating that exact kind of value. So I think this might be one of the best cards in the set, and no one else thinks that. So I'm going to call it a sleeper. But that's all I got for this list. Like I said, this could have been a 28 card list so just let me know what your entries would have been down there in the comments section how you felt about all of my drivel <laughs> down there and uh all my all my takes and what my what my list looked like and all that stuff just let me know just let me know down there in the sideboard aside from that do all the stuff i said to do earlier even though i hate telling you to do it just like subscribe do the things we're trying to make 150k subs we need like 25k to get there so long journey but we will make it and your sub is going to be a part of that. Aside from that, you can check out the Twitch where we play some Magic Thursday evening. We will be playing Magic when the set officially drops. Aside from that, check out the Patreon. Dollar a month to vote on what deck techs and other video essays and content we do once the season really starts rolling around here. And follow me on Twitter for the occasional takes. You'll know when I'm streaming more often that way. You'll know what videos I'm about to put out that way. There's a reason to follow me on Twitter. I'm sure of it gotta be right but in any case <laughs> i'm done for this so again i'll turn it over to you let me know how you felt about it and i will catch you cats later i'm deb from the place thanks for watching wizards spread love and be kind